Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Hell Yes Life podcast. I am your host, Norman Bell, and I am really excited today because I have as my guest, Matt Brawning. Let me tell you a little bit about Matt. Uh, Matt is a best-selling author, a master trainer of NLP, that's Neuro Linguistic Programming, and Matt was a self-made millionaire by the age of 25 years old. Congratulations, Matt. Thank you. Uh, Matt speaks and produces workshops all over the world in places like Australia, New Zealand, and even Fiji. He hosts the Purpose Driven Entrepreneur podcast, which was filmed in the movie The Journey with Brian Tracy and Bob Proctor. Love Bob, Bob Proctor, by the way. And uh, he consults with Fortune 100 companies on leadership. Some of his clients have included U.S. Bank, John McAfee, the founder of McAfee Antivirus, Ron Welty, former drummer of The Offspring. I'm going to ask you about that later. <laughs> New York Life, uh, the YMCA, and others. Um, welcome, Matt Browning, to the Hell Yes Life podcast. Are you ready to tell us about your Hell Yes Life? Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do this. All I right. can't wait. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for bringing me on. Yeah, thanks so much. I, um, I connected with you on Facebook uh, or Hell Yes Life listeners. I, I connected with Matt on Facebook and I just saw all the great stuff that he was up to. And um, honestly, a little bit of like, wow, I want to be like Matt. I want to do all this stuff. So I, I'm, I'm really excited to share what Matt is up to with you. And um, actually, Matt, can you just give us a little bit of an intro kind of a, um, I know that you have a, a book that we'll get into that you that you just released. So we'll kind of maybe talk about that first. And then I want to get into the little bit of the inner workings of your uh, purpose-driven business. So sure. uh, take it away. So what, what I'm up to now, uh, you know, so the, I, I've been an entrepreneur for 16 years since 2002. That was the last time I got, I didn't get a paycheck that I wrote myself. <laughs> mm. And I am on salary with the business, but we'll, maybe we'll get to that too. Um, so, you know, now I can I spend my time between them and doing uh, really fun, having a podcast and terrestrial radio and television media tour, uh, promoting the book for the last month. That's been a lot of fun with the publisher. It's called The Firebox Principle, The Seven Drives, that Fuel Every Entrepreneur. And, you know, it's just I spend the time between the book uh, and then doing a lot of live speaking. You know, at this point, I've produced over 200, I think 250 nearly uh, multi-day live events. So that means three days or longer, those kind of weekend workshops that many of us go to. Um, and I've done them in 18 cities and four countries all over the place. Wow. And at this point, I just, I, I love it. You know, I, I get to help people change their lives for a living. We get to do NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which is all about mindset, um, habit changes, things like that. But then we also do a lot of kind of business turnaround work. So that's what I've been venturing more into in, in recent years. And uh, that's where some of the corporate client work comes from. And uh, I just have a blast kind of going between personal development and then working on uh, kind of high level leadership stuff. Wouldn't have my life any other way. And I have an awesome. amazing life here at Lola at home with me in Michigan and a seven year old son named Valiant. And he's just crushing it in second grade now doing well. All right. <laughs> yeah. Life is good. All right. Yeah. My, my daughter just started third grade, so I'm, I'm right in there with you. Um, and gosh, it sounds like you're living your hell yes life. You're an, an amazing life there. And um, I can't wait to hear more about the different pieces of your business. But let's, let's start off with the Firebox principle since that just came out. Um, so you just said, the, can you tell the kind of the sub uh, headline there, the seven drives? Yeah, the seven drives that fuel every entrepreneur. Yeah. So do tell, kind of unpack that a little bit. So, so I came up with the idea, um, I was reading up on old locomotive steam engines and oh. what you find with every old, you know, and even today, right? Any steam engine in the center of it, hidden deep in the center is a firebox. It's where they put the fuel in, whether it's coal, like, you know, back in the day, the Brits would use coal. Uh, Americans would favor wood. You've used sugar byproducts, corn, all sorts of things to fuel the steam engine. And you know, when the fire in the firebox gets hot enough, then it pushes momentum forward. So I realized, gosh, what a metaphor. You know, so in our lives and in our business, it, essentially for visionaries, right? So whether this is in the nonprofit sector, it's in the ministry sector, it's in the business sector, it's uh, your, your passion for art, for music, for your family, whatever it is, every one of us has a firebox that I believe God put inside us and we have to begin to realize what fuel we're using to move forward. And it was interesting because I didn't expect to find what I found. What I did is I looked at many case studies of some of the most successful entrepreneurs on the planet over the last hundred years. And, you know, where pe 
people from Andrew Carnegie to uh, Elon Musk, you know, so past and present. And what's fascinating is when you look at the origin stories of these entrepreneurs, you find that what fuels them or what fueled them to get started might not be what you think. Um, surprisingly, a lot of the entrepreneurs were fueled by revenge. I call it the Avenger drive. They want to get back at someone. They want to prove someone wrong. And there's so many great stories, tremendous businesses, things like, you know, uh, James Dyson who started Dyson vacuums and, and uh, fans, Lamborghini, you know, was started out of a rivalry and out of anger because Enzo Ferrari said he was a, a lame tractor mechanic and he didn't want to get advice from him. So Lamborghini said, you know what, forget you, I'll start my own car. So it's, so the book trails through all these different stories and I pepper my own origin stories in as well for different business. I've been, I've had four different businesses in the last 16 years. So I filter different businesses I've done and different parts of my life. Uh, and what you'll find is it's not a personality profiling system. What it is, it's a motivation detector. Hmm. And you, well, that's actually the first time I've said that phrase. All right, oh, Norman okay. Bell, mark it oh, down. Yeah, okay, motivation. I'm writing it down here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the first time I've said that phrase. But I think it's accurate. It's, it's a motivation detector to find and uncover your deep motivations under the surface for why you're doing the thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. And like you might find, Norman, that you have a different fire drive for your podcast than maybe you do for another area in business. Hmm. You might find it's different for volunteer work you do and so forth. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, what are some of the different fire drives? So we have revenge. I'm hoping that there's maybe something else. <laughs> no, no. <the, laughs> start let's, a revenge based. <laughs> let's start on the dark side. <laughs> so, so think of like, so, so often, and I'm sure you probably, um, just from talking, you know, our little pre-chat before uh, we, we, we hit record, I'm sure you've probably gone to some seminars and you're a pretty positive guy, obviously, right? At a personal development and so forth. And I think what I find is in this industry, I've, I've been coaching and speaking this space for 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, everything was like positive, positive, positive. This is just amazing. And look, I'm a happy guy. I'm a positive guy. Mm -hmm. But what I do find is when you look deep inside the, the motivation of human nature, that's not always, the, like we'll always, Tony Robbins says it best. He says, we'll, we'll do more to avoid pain than to gain pleasure. Mm -hmm. Right. And he actually took that from the pragmatist, uh, William James in the 1800s. He came up with the pain pleasure principle in his books. And, and what we find is no matter what, we're always, if I'm upset or if I'm scared, I'm always going to run faster away from the lion than I am towards the food. Mm -hmm. So if you, rather than trying to be overly positive or trying to be overly negative, right, that's not the case. Rather, what I want to do with the book is we look at the, the true natural drives that drive human beings and visionaries to move forward and create the things we create. So if you can tap into your real, honest, authentic drive, even if it's not what you like, you'll find that you can go further and you can actually brand and bring that story into the equation. Mm -hmm. right? So a great example would be, um, th th there's a really great, I didn't put this in the book, but I'm gonna, I'll add it in the second edition. I just spent some time in the UK with my wife on a vacation last month, and I guess it was in July and August. Anyway, um, one of the great stories that came out uh, around the UK was this um, restaurant called Witherspoons. And Witherspoons is kind of like their Denny's, but it's a brew pub. And you know, they're everywhere and they're open all the time and people go there Sunday afternoons. Well, Witherspoon, the guy was in, in in elementary school and his teacher told him you're you're too slow you're always fool around in class and was really really negative towards this kid and said you're not gonna amount to anything and you should drop out basically and he was so hurt by it and so mad that it fueled him to say you know what I'm not gonna buy into your story about me I'm gonna find a way I'm gonna make this work and I'm gonna be a success despite your lack of support yeah so he started his first restaurant across the street from the school. <laughs> he named it Witherspoons after his third grade teacher, Mrs. Witherspoon. The, the one that, that had said. That's exactly right. And he put <laughs> it up on purpose across the street from a school. So every day she could walk to her car and look out and see that she was wrong. Uh, now, I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. <laughs> right, right, right. What I am saying is it's amazing when you tap into the, the real natural motivations and drives, how far we can go. Uh, so the Avenger drive is the one that, now sometimes it's to prove a point. Sometimes it's also to avenge, to make a wrong right, to fix something. 
James Dyson did that in the vacuum industry. He looked at the vacuum industry and he thought, you know, I, I he came up with the, um, uh, how do you call it? Not the turbine engine, the, uh, like the tornado sort of uh, bagless vacuum. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah. he was, the, so James Dyson in Britain was the inventor of this, but the vacuum industry was like, was, was kind of like um, the old car guys in Detroit, right? They were like, we don't want electric cars and they didn't want a bagless vacuum. They don't want to change your technology. We got the old suction power. It stinks, but it works. Or I guess you could say it sucks, you know, in vacuum language. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so he went, it was the equivalent of bringing an electric car to Detroit in the eighties. Like they're going to tell you to get lost. Yeah. So he had to go to America. And then he went to Asia and he went all over the world bringing this new technology that was a much more efficient energy source. And he was sick and tired of uh, consumers having to buy new disposable vacuums every time they turned around. Mm. So he was, he was so mad about that. He was like, that's not fair. They buy a hundred dollar vacuum. Now they got to buy $10 in bags every month. Like you're taking advantage of people. Yeah. So he said, I'm going to come up with a bagless vacuum. Everybody said, you can't do it. He went around until he finally got it big and now it became the new standard. If you go to Target or, or Myers or wherever today, um, basically every vacuum is a bagless vacuum and they all use Dyson's materials. But Dyson was fueled because the industry needed, he wanted to right a wrong in the industry. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's one of my favorite ones to talk about. <laughs> so that's called the Avenger Drive. The Avenger Drive. Right. I, I, that, I find it, it was a more, more um, positive than the Revenge Drive. Originally, I called it the Anger Slash Revenge Drive and nobody wanted to re relate with that. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, I don't the Avenger no, Drive. Like, oh, the Avenger Drive. Yeah, the Avengers. Yeah, I want. Cool. I want to be an Avenger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to be like the Hulk or somebody. Um, okay, so give us like maybe one or two other drives. Sure. So, so there's uh, there's a significance drive, and this is the one that will attend. You have like a Rupert Murdoch who relates to the uh, significance drive, and usually this is the place where the purpose for building a vision. And I just want to back up. When I say vision, I mean you can be a visionary, an inventor, a creator, an artist, a blogger, a podcaster, uh, a coach, a business owner. It's not just running a business, right? It's so much more. Yeah. But if you have a message and a vision inside you that you must share and you need to get it out, like that's who I'm talking to, right? Yeah. That's you. Yeah. That's and awesome. oftentimes the people who, who bring this vision – Again, on the surface, oh, they want to you know, make a big impact in the world. They want to change people's lives. But if they go deep inside, the honest truth might be they lacked significance younger, right, mm -hmm. as a younger person. And it's either because somebody either poo-pooed them young, right, and, and, and you know, whether it was abuse or neglect, there's that. The more common one is the person usually grows up in a shadow of somebody great. So you're, you had a father with a big name, right? Mm -hmm. um, I find this a lot with, uh, with kids that grow up with like a pro athlete dad, and then they get into business or sport or whatever. And now it's a question of, well, hang on, who am I? I don't want to be his son. So there's this drive to make a name for myself. Yeah. And it's not egotistical and I don't think it's even negative, but if, again, if you tap into it and you go, no, I, I, I want my story to matter. I want my name to be remembered. I think every, every human at some level has that desire. So, uh, so that's one of the biggest desires. And uh, so you have people uh, like uh, Rupert Murdoch, of course. Uh, I put in, I'm, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. WWE is one of my favorite things. Um, I don't know how, how, I think we're pretty close in the same age. And uh, so yeah. I grew up watching it in the 80s on Saturday mornings. Hulk, and I'm Hulk always Hogan, you know. I'm on. Yeah, Randy Macho Man Savage. Yeah, yeah. okay. Those, those so yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? You know yeah, I don't, I don't know what you're yeah. <laughs> well, Vincent McMahon, who founded the WWF at the time, now they call yeah. it the WWE, right? We're Wrestling Entertainment. People don't really, they kind of, oh yeah, it's just pro wrestling, that fake stuff. It's like, no, no, no. First off, it's not fake, it's predetermined. But secondly... <laughs> I've it's never heard it put that way. That's great. Yeah, it's predetermined. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's just predetermined. But yeah. well, because I mean, some of the some of those bumps are pretty real. But the, yeah. the point of the story is, Vince McMahon has built a billion dollar public company. It's it's one of the largest entertainment companies in the world. They produce movies. They have their a whole network. Yeah, that goes for nine ninety nine a month. They have well over a million plus subscribers. They do okay. Yeah. But people still think it's just, oh, it's pro wrestling. Well, what Vince McMahon did is back in the day, it was all territory wrestling. So it was all regional. So his dad had a promotion in New York and then other people had a promotion in Georgia or California or, or Canada, or whatever. Well, he had this vision of, you know, he was a third generation promoter and his father, Vince Sr., uh, he never wanted to be called junior. He didn't like that. So even to this day, people can't call him Vince Jr. compared to his dad. They have to call him Vincent Kennedy McMahon, which is his different middle name. 
<laughs> and I just find it fascinating. Vince McMahon wanted to build an empire that was his own. Yeah. It was beyond what his dad did. So oftentimes with a significance drive, it's someone who wants to get out from the shadow of something and prove and make their way. So again, the whole point of this is there's a significance drive, the spiritual drive, the contribution drive is about people. The thrive drive is all about advancing your, your station in life. And I have all the stories in the book, uh, the firebox principle. And there's, there's a bunch of stories in every single chapter on the seven drives. But again, just to come back, the, the most important thing we can get if we're living that hell yes life is, is this is what this is all about, is you want to get congruent and, and honest with the drive that pushes you forward, whether you think it's cool or not. If you know what your drive is, and once you go through the book, like, you know, you really will, you really will be able to find out uh, what your major driving force is. So the whole idea is when you know what it is, you either A, align with it and wave that flag with pride and say, this is me, this is who I am, I'm going to write a story about it. Or B, you decide to change it. And you decide, you know what, I used to be fueled with anger, that's not important anymore. What I really need is to get about the people that I'm helping here. And Maybe you decide it's time to shift. And oftentimes with, with corporate clients, I'll help them go in and shift their entire culture from the top down, which takes time. Um, but when you shift it, the team and eventually all of your clients and your customers will begin to get that that's what drives you. That's why you do what you do. And you'll find a, a, a thriving tribe of people who love you. You'll find more loyalty. You'll find more customer engagement. You'll find more employee retention all because now they have a banner to come around and they have a story to buy into with you. So that's kind of the, the, the story on the book. Love it. Love it. I'll have to check that out. I'm interested in, you know, I, maybe we'll, we'll talk about you know, your business or other things that you're doing, but I want to um, read about those other drives as well. And let me ask you, what's, what would you say is your drive? Well, and, here, and this is such a great question because now, of course, right, I, I've been asked that a couple of times now. And what I'd say is in the book, I, I hit about five out of the seven drives. I share a story from my life about different times when I felt that. Like when I was 18, I got into the mortgage business and I didn't know what I was doing, but I, these two brothers mentored me and they showed me everything about it. And what I realized is I started making good money. And by 22, I started my own business doing the same thing. But it wasn't about the money. It wasn't about having cars and houses, even though I was able to make some success there. What it was really about, I found out, was the significance. Because I was, I was a baby in the family. I wasn't neglected, but you know, my sister was the overachiever. My brother was the troublemaker. And I was the kid that was okay. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So there was this piece of me that was like, I wanted, I wanted an accolade. You know, I wanted, uh, at 18, 19, 20, I wanted someone to go, wow, I'm so impressed. That's so great you've been able to create something because I never really did anything significant in my first 18 years. I wasn't, you know, captain of the football team. I didn't play sports. I, you know, I didn't do anything major. So I realized that the significance drive really ruled me early in my life. But then when I switched into life coaching, I made that major transition in my late 20s. That's when, like, I gave up on the money thing and I gave up on the significance. And I said, look, I don't care. I don't want to be front row. I want to be a volunteer. You know, uh, I don't want to have it all. I want to give it all. Mm -hmm. And everything in my mind shifted and changed. My soul was just to, to help someone else change their life. And that's when I started putting on my first ever workshops. And I started having life coaching clients. It took a while to ramp up and actually have any success in there, partially because I was so driven by the contribution drive. Mm -hmm. So driven. I didn't care about making money. I was like, I just want to help people. I don't care what happens. And that can be so powerful, but it also can be a detriment, right? Because um, I, I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of life coaches that are life coaching from, um, you know, from a trailer in the driveway because they can't pay the rent. Right. Uh, because the, but partially it's because they care so much, but we need to find a way to be able to balance our drives as well. So what, let's, let's just take that example. So there you, you are, you've shifted um, to the contribution drive. What drive um, would you recommend someone shift to, to kind of balance things out where you're um, making an abundant living, but still contributing obviously to other people's lives? Or like what, what shift did you make? Because obviously you're, you're um, successful at what you're doing now. Well, it's a great question. I think that there's a lot more to that, that goes into uh, the drive. So the drives are about motivation. But it's also not just a, a one drive. So um, I'm working on right now, I'm not sure when this, this episode will drop, but I'm working on a Firebox quiz that should come out uh, towards the end of 2018. And what the quiz will do is actually give you a ranking of your drives. So it's not about, like, like 
I, I caution everyone when you read the book, like you want to pigeonhole yourself and go, oh, that's me. You know, I'm the Thrive Drive. But you really like stay away from thinking of it as a personality type. It's not Myers-Briggs. It's not DISC. It's not Strengths Finders. It's, it's not yeah. those things. What it is is simply motivations. And motivations are all contextual. Yeah. So in a business, you might have one motivation. Uh, and again, like I said, in, in your volunteer time, it might be another one. Uh, on vacation time, it might be another one, right? So every different context in life. But you'll also have a primary, secondary, and I love this word, tertiary. tertiary. <laughs> but first, second, third, right? Yeah. <laughs> you'll have a ranking of, of the drive. So if you had, let's say, I had contribution drive as number one. And what I did, though, is I rejected the thrive drive. So thrive, the thrive drive is about improving your station in life. So whether it's a, a family who comes over as refugees and they, and they sacrifice everything so their kids can have a future, that's Thrive Drive, right? Um, or, and probably contribution is up there too with the family, but it's about me and my family improving our station. Or whether it's I want to get my fourth jet and my fifth yacht, you know, all of that is the same thing at, at a certain level, Thrive Drive. But you could have, so I had contribution drive number one, but I rejected my Thrive Drive. And I said, I don't want the money anymore. I want to help people. What I began to realize over the course of about two years, because in two years, I made $900 as a life coach. Yeah. $900. I had three clients. Two of them were free, if you get my drift. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, and it took a while. But finally, I, I had a chance to break out. And it was through speaking and putting on workshops. After two years toiling at it and just trying to change lives, something in my mind tweaked. And I realized, when did I decide that I couldn't contribute to people and have a good living? And I had this, I've run into this a lot. There's a belief that people have, students and clients I find so often that it's, you have to pick one or the other, you know, because that's how the world looks, right? You either yeah. are, you know, you're a pro athlete or you're a mafia or you're a big business person and you're greedy and you make a bunch, you make millions of dollars for throwing a basketball, right? Mm -hmm. It's that mentality or it's. Um, I'm a member, you know, I, I'm clergy. I'm talking about the good ones, right? I know there's a lot of bad stories happening as well. But, you know, someone, I want to devote my life to God. I want to devote my life to being an elementary school teacher. I want to be a, a hospice caretaker, right? Yeah. Uh, a counselor of sorts. So it's either I want to help people, but I have to be broke. Or I want to get rich because I'm selfish. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was living in that paradigm as well. Mm -hmm. Because I made a lot of money in real estate. And, and I focused on building the business. I cared about people, but that wasn't my top thing. Then I changed 180 degrees and said, it's only about people and I don't care about money. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here to say I'm living proof that it's, it's a bad idea to be too singular focused. Like you can only have the one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so I started changing that and I realized what happened is my thrive drive motivation increased. And I would say today I probably world impact drive is another drive and that's starting to come up higher in my business and life. Um, you know, I've only been at it, like I said, you know, in this particular business for 12 years, which is long, but short, you know, sometimes I say like in the personal growth industry, it's kind of like dog years, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> there's a lot of people that come and go. Um, but I haven't been doing it for three or four decades yet. Yeah. And, but even after a decade doing it, you start to ask different questions and I start to say, well, you know, how does it matter long term? I know I made a difference for this person today, which I'm so grateful for. Right. And 10 years ago, that was all that mattered. But now it's like, but what happens next? How can I take this whole industry and maybe bring it up a notch to another level? How can mm -hmm. I leave a lasting uh, dent in what and how people approach this thing? Um, there's a lot of good people in the industry. There's certainly some snake oil salesmen, some bad people. I, I, I believe I'm one of the good ones and I really try hard to stay that way. Um, so I look at the industry constantly and think, how can I make the coaching industry have more longevity, have more credibility? So it's about making an impact as well as making a difference for people as well as, Hey, I work hard. I, I've learned a lot along the ways. I think my advice is very valuable. You know, when, when I take on a, a, someone who wants to put on their own workshops or coach and I take them on and mentor them in one of the programs, like I know I can help them to get their business launched and off the ground. Yeah. So what's that worth? If you can now help people live your dream and make a few hundred thousand dollars a year. So I don't mind charging also for the value I bring. So it's kind of like, you know, yeah. these different drives are floating around in my life. And uh, again, you know, in the book, you can see that there's different parts go to different areas in life. And you'll probably find in your past, as you look through the last, you know, years of life, you'll go, oh, I relate when I was 20 to this one. When I was in college, I relate to that one and, it, you know, and so forth and so on. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, let's say I can relate to uh, the the um, the significance drive you were uh, talking about. Like the the reason that this um, podcast is called the Hell Yes Life Podcast was that uh-huh. I gave a speech back in high school. I ran for a um, elect, uh, you know, student council position with the slogan "Hell Yes, Vote for Norm," and I. And, you know, people were on their feet going, hell yes. And, and it, it, I felt 20 feet tall that day. So I felt that, I guess, probably that significance. I'd like to say, oh, yeah, this was all about, you know, helping others. But probably at the time, I just, you know, it just felt great to um, have a success like that. And so I think that I'm probably in that same space of, yeah, significance drive is part of it, but shifting into the contribution drive. And, but and I think it's just kind of an awareness of all these different, uh, motivating factors in your life, right? Because I also don't want to be, um, you know, just uh, scrout, you know, you need to be, you need to have an abundant life to be able to um, have more impact, I would say, right? Like, you don't, you For can't sure. be living in scarcity yourself and then trying to um, make other people's lives uh, more successful. So, well, so many people are doing that nowadays too, yeah. where it's like, there's a lot of uh, coaches and programs that are churning out more coaches and programs and, and which is fine. But what starts to happen is sometimes the lack of experience comes in, right? Yeah. So it's one of my biggest pet peeves where we call it the expert industry, right? Oh, yeah. be an expert. But we forget that sometimes to become an expert in the expert industry as a coach, a trainer, a speaker, what have you, you have to actually become an expert at something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what people do is they'll lead like, oh my gosh, I, I, love, um, I, I love coaching people through this and, and helping them to do it the right way. So people will leave a 20-year career in human resources where they, they're an expert. They're amazing. They do so well, but they're tired of corporate America. Mm -hmm. So then they say, I'm starting a business being a coach. So I said, what do you do? I help divorcees overcome the obstacles of depression so they can relive their new passionate life today. Mm -hmm. And I said, when did you decide to do that? She goes, well, because I got divorced last year. And I just think to myself, like, I love your heart that you care about that because that's what you've gone through. But the truth is, you're not an expert in this. It's just something that you have currently gone through. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be until you've really walked through it all the way and helped a bunch of people walk through it that you might look back five years later and go, you know, I'm actually pretty good at helping people walk through this. And maybe then you start a coaching business, but don't do it three months into your own divorce, right? Instead, what if you started a coaching business, um, helping entrepreneurs solve, you know, HR problems like the big guys do, Uh you know, and Uh and it's like big guy solutions for the little guy or whatever it is you want to do, but like bring in your expertise that you've been doing for years and bring that to the table, and now you have a legitimate uh, expertise. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but absolutely. That's, that's so my take on that. I'm going to actually take advantage of this moment to you, you can give me like a three minute mini coaching session on this because I'm sort of in that place because I have a communications background, um, and I when I think about communications, I I don't feel that passionate about it, and I'm shifting into doing more of this personal development stuff that I feel more more passionate about. Yes, so I could be like that person that you were just talking about there, but and so then I keep and then I I don't know if you're familiar with the the phrase kind of a multi passionate multi potential or whatever. So I have a hard time of wanting to say, oh, I'm the um, storytelling guy. I'm the speaker guy. Uh, you know, so I have like a bunch of different interests, but it sounds like you're basically saying, um, or, or tell me, so like, let's say I don't feel that passionate about communications, but you're still saying at least, you know, lead with that, uh, that, the, the thing that you have the background in, and then maybe you can develop it from there into other things or. Yeah. So, so the, there's a few ways to approach this. And let me, let me give this a shot. I think this will actually be really fun. I love, I love live coaching anyway. So let's have some fun, shall we? Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. So what kind of communications did you do or what, like, what is the background? How long is it? Well, um, yeah, that it's, it's, it's kind of a no, in some ways a no brainer for me, because that's what I've been doing since college is, uh, you know, I have some journal, journalism background. I, you know, have done, uh, this is almost like a little ad for my <laughs> corporate communication skill. And uh, I've, I've worked with, you know, uh, fortune 500 companies like Microsoft, Hewlett, Hewlett Packard, AT&T and so forth. Um, I, uh, you know, I've done storytelling workshops. I've been a public speaking coach for nonprofits and, and so on. So I, I've kind of gone down that road a bit and I just, um, so why did you pick the word communications? Cause when I hear like storytelling and speaking, yeah. That's, so when you say communications in my mind, I think more journalism or broadcast or radio. Did uh-huh. you, were you in that mode as well? 
I, I, I mean, I, um, <laughs> so we're doing a coaching session for me. Okay, cool. Uh, so, uh, we, um, hey, this I, is I, up to, it's your podcast. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Let's do it. Uh, I majored in communications in college. I mean, that's what they call it, communication. So it was journalism. Uh, and, and then I've just maybe gotten into the habit of calling all of this under the, the general umbrella of communications. Got that. Okay, great. What do you think is the the biggest area? So if, if you broke down communications and chunked it down into like all the different categories, you could call it subcategories, let's say, yeah. what's the one that maybe you did the longest or the most prevalent or the biggest experience with? I mean, I probably have the most experience writing. Um, I also, okay, and then separate to that, but I think still under the sort of general umbrella is I uh, have a theater background. I've, you know, been in some film and I, I'm an award-winning speaker. So, and that's a real passion of mine. So I, I love doing that. But then I thought, well, do I want to speak about speaking? And, you know, like <laughs> just how to speak. I want to speak about like kind of the stuff we're talking about today. So, yeah, yeah. man, I, I love that. So, so depending on how you want to do it, here, here's the concept. You want to, I, I believe, what works the best is to find a way to bridge those two things together. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be the most obvious thing. So it's not that you now need to teach communication seminars, right? Or, or public speak about public speaking, although you certainly could. But what you don't want to do, this is where it, it can become a struggle if, um, if you've come from this big background where you've done all this great stuff, and then I just watch people, it's almost like they flush it down the toilet in a way. I'm not saying you're doing that, but yeah. they go, well, that was there. That's another industry. That doesn't really matter because today I'm helping people overcome depression, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. What you want to do instead is find a way to say, well, if I'm going to help, let's just say people overcome depression, and that's the sure. thing you're passionate about right now, one of your multi-passions and purposes, that's the thing. How can a skill set that you've learned along the way be the thing that helps them to do that. Mm -hmm. So is it about helping to rewrite the terrible story they've been telling themselves? Yeah. Is it about um, stepping into a different version of them through becoming a powerful communicator and influencer and that's going to help you to change your state? Mm -hmm. They come up with kind of, I don't like this word, but I think it's kind of, it's pro wrestling. So I like to use it. It's like, like what's your gimmick? You know, uh -huh. what's the, Hey, here's my, uh, my tool that's in this box. This is the thing. This is the end all be all. This is the thing that'll help you to get that result that I'm talking about. Right. So the result is in the thing you're passionate about. Yeah. Tools and the way you get that result, find a way to bridge the gap and bring what you've been doing. Yeah. Because here's what it does. And I don't know how, I have no idea how long you've been doing the new piece or working in personal development, but for someone who, especially if they're starting like in the first six months or year or two years, it can be really hard to gain traction mm -hmm. because it's a brand new thing from scratch. If you do it this way, you're not starting from scratch. Now you go, listen, you know, I've been doing communications and speaker training for 20 years. Like I know my stuff and Today, what I love to do is I help, you know, everyday people who are battling depression overcome that by learning how to rewrite new stories, by doing free journaling, by, by becoming more powerful communicators and, being, and, learn, and using those skills to reach out and make deeper connections with people around them. Right. Now, I'm just shooting from the hip. So whatever that is, yeah. the idea though is you, you do not ever delete or, or, or turn 180 degrees from what you were doing before with corporate work, you incorporate it, Got right? It. Got it. And then you bring that in as one of your greatest resources. And now you're a 20 year or 10 year veteran. You're not uh, some startup uh, coach and that differentiates you from every other coach. So that's my two cents. Love it. Love it. Well, I'll, I, I'll keep in touch with you, Matt, about how I, you know, I had a conversation with somebody else yesterday that was a, along the same lines of like, yeah, don't, you know, don't reject what you're, you've been doing before, build on that and, you know, find a way to sort of incorporate it with your passion. So hell yes, lifers out there, um, <laughs> hopefully that was beneficial for you to hear as well, because maybe you're in that situation. Maybe you've just, um, you're stepping away from a, um, a corporate career or whatever that you, you want to kind of quote unquote put behind you, but, but maybe there's something from that that you can use to propel yourself forward in your new passion based business. So, um, so Matt, well, talk, talk, tell us a little bit about, cause you mentioned, okay, so there you were in the contribution 
drive and you were making 900 bucks in two years and then you shifted and started doing what what was tell bring us to that that moment where what what was the shifting uh point for you like it sounds like you shifted to the thrive drive but then what did you start doing you started doing seminars is that right yeah yeah so so even well during those two years i was putting on seminars like I put on my first workshop ever in 2006. It was a big success. There were six people there. <laughs> <laughs> Two yep. of them were my parents. Yep. <laughs> and, right. And four of them were friends and nobody bought anything because I didn't know that people would ever want to, you know, and I don't know, they'd want to learn more. So I put on this one day seminars, all I ever knew at the time. In the end, I just thought, gosh, seminars suck. Like I don't, how can I, because I realized this, I said, I'm so passionate about this. I want to do this for a living. But I don't, I spent a lot. I spent like five or $6,000 to put on my first seminar for six people. Mm. And, and I didn't make any money from it. And it wasn't about the money, right? But it, it struck me that if I don't make money doing this, it's a very expensive uh, volunteer position. Mm-hmm. And if I just care about helping people, I should just go to the soup kitchen. Mm-hmm. right? And volunteer there, which I've done. And, and, and that's lovely, but it's different, right? It's not building a business. It's not, um, well, I just want to be careful how I say that because it does make a big impact, but you know what, where I'm going with that, right? Yeah. It's, you're not making a mark maybe in the way that you envisioned, right? So, so long story short, I struggled with this for a couple of years and then, and then I had that, that change. I was having a conversation with a young man and I remember this, I, I was, I was trying to raise my rate, right? Saying I charge, you know, like I charge $3,000 an hour today. And that's, I actually get that. That's just a regular, like that's my rate. Mm-hmm. Um, but it took time to get to the point where I, I believe and now have, have proven that I can deliver that much value, right? Mm-hmm. With, with one hour together, I can take someone who's making a million dollars and show them half a million in extra revenue or right. So with the right clients, sure. it's like yeah. that's going to work. Um, but it, when I started off, it was like 150 an hour. 300 an hour. And I remember saying I made 300 an hour or I build that. And this young guy said, I can't believe this. You know, I thought you were one of the good guys. Oh. And I was like, what do you mean? As, but, but I got curious. So I asked him what his belief system was basically, right? The, what yeah. I call the BS, you know, cause we all have some BS, the, the, the belief system. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said, what, you know, what do you believe about that? Like, what's the alternative? And he said, well, it's just, I'm so sick of these therapists and counselors that charge so much money. And then I said, why is that a problem? Cause I wanted to under, cause I realized that he had the same belief. I had the same one deep down somewhere. Right. And cause I looked at athletes that are making 3 million a year and thought, Oh, come on, that's not fair. And he said this, he said, if they really cared, they wouldn't charge that much. So I said, ah, so the people who really care shouldn't make the money. He said, yeah. And I said, so if the good people don't make the money, who does? <laughs> and he's, he froze for like three seconds. His eyes got wide and he went, I guess the bad ones. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. So it's like if, if you have to be a scam artist or a criminal or, or a, in the mafia, or again, this isn't the same genre, but you know, sports star or movie star, if they make all the money for seemingly not doing as much work or not doing as good of work, how, you know, which I don't believe that anymore, but people see the world that way. Mm-hmm. If they make all the money, that means all the people that are caring, the, the ministries, the teachers, the counselors, the parents, like they don't. So I, so I believe firmly, I believe in a world where our teachers can be paid six figures a year and then some, you mm-hmm. know, like, and, and I don't know exactly how it'll work. Right. So don't debate me on Twitter at Matt Browning. If you want to follow me there, don't debate me there and say, well, that's impossible because X, Y, Z, what I'm saying is it should be possible. Let's find a way. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe it's on, it's on a, a achievement based, you know, where you could track a first grade teachers, students over the years and see what they accomplish and see how well they go or see how much time they put into each kid or how involved they get with a family. And those teachers that seem to, if you can grade caring somehow, the teachers who care more and give more are able to be rewarded more. Right. And it's like, what if that was the case? And we used some of that greed money and we actually put it into the good thing. So um, I had that shift in my mind. I realized I don't need to be someone who makes a difference and goes broke. Yeah. I think I can have both. I legitimately believe that I can be a millionaire. I can be a multimillionaire. I can make a lot of money. And now I find that the more money I make, the more people I can help anyway. Absolutely. The more marketing I can reach with the business, the more people attend my seminars, which is good for me 
which is good for the team that I've built. Yeah, I have a team of about seven or eight people, um, you know, contractors and employees. We have an office in Orange County, uh, run workshops all throughout the year. And every time I make more money, I don't actually take more. And I think this is, people don't talk about this a lot or enough, I don't think. So as a business owner, a lot of early business owners treat it like a piggy bank, right? So if I make $10,000 in sales, I just made $10,000. Right. And then I go buy an iPad, right? Mm -hmm. So when, but as you grow a business and scale it, you have to stop treating it like a piggy bank. And so I start treating myself like an employee. So I get, I have a salary I take every week, a pretty decent, you know, not anything huge, but I take enough and I have a personal budget. And then I take a quarterly bonus draw as a small percentage of the profits. Mm. And I just, I, that's all I do. And I get by just fine. My family's, you know, it's fine. We just bought a house out here. Everything's doing well. But if I sold next year, say $300,000 in, uh, in coaching or programs or whatnot next month, I'm not going to take extra money and buy a Lamborghini, right? Mm -hmm. I would buy a Lamborghini, not a Ferrari, just as a callback. To yeah. our earlier conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but instead of buying a Lamborghini, I'm going to look and say, can I hire someone else? And can I take someone who has this dream of coaching and helping? Can I bring someone else on the team? Yeah. Um, can I expand and get more inventory? Can I, um, uh, we, we, with a book, we partnered with the Burn Institute of San Diego. So one of the ways I do that is A, um, the profits from the book. So when the publisher pays me my royalties, all those royalties are donated to the Burn Institute of San Diego. And oh, what wow. they do is they put on uh, burn camps for kids. Really cool one. It's, uh, and I, I did a, a, I'm going off on this, but I just, I love it so much. Yeah, when I was nine, I attended a burn camp because uh, I burned, I don't know if you What's a burn camp? You got it. Yeah. So a burn camp. So if you can see this or not, it's not great light, but my hand got burned. Oh, yeah. um, I'm showing you on the Zoom if you're listening on the audio and really bad burn when I was a baby and I had a lot of skin grafts and surgeries over time. My last moment, I was nine. So at 10, I got invited by a burn association to go to this camp. And basically it was a camp for burn survivors mm -hmm. of all different degrees and varying um, uh, healing. And then the volunteers are all of the, um, all the, what are they, not the chiefs, what are they called? Uh, counselors, <laughs> camp counselors, uh -huh. looking for the word, are either, you know, usually firefighters, um, uh, counselors themselves, or adult burn survivors. And it's a place, it's a summer camp that kids with scars can go and forget that they have scars. Mm. And this one is actually called Beyond the Scars. Yeah. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. And I remember, you know, the first day I went to camp, I looked around and I saw these kids and I, I thought, oh my gosh, like they have scars, you know, all over their face. You know, one kid uh, um, was in a basement and a water heater exploded in their house oh and gosh. he was just scorched with boiling water and his two younger brothers were close by. So all three of the brothers had burn scars all over them. Wow. And he became one of my best friends at camp. And I remember this, the first day, all I could see was the scars on his face because it was just so noticeable. By the second day, I barely noticed. And by the third day and beyond, I forgot to even see him. And, and he was just being a kid again. And so was I, and so was everybody else. You know, kids are taking their shirts off and going swimming and, and cause now nobody's staring. Right. 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 And, and in everyday life, you can't help but go, Oh, cause you don't see that all the time, but that's their daily life. So I love the camp. I think it's phenomenal. I'm going to be volunteering at the one coming up next summer. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so, so we donate all the proceeds to the burn camp. It takes a thousand dollars to send a kid to camp. So, so far as we record this, we just, just went over uh, 10 kids. So this year we've raised over $10,000 oh, uh, yeah. and went directly to the burn camp, right? It's just the coolest thing. So now 10 kids get to have free camp and go just be kids again and, and get their childhood back. So it's, um, I'm not even sure where that even came from, but it, it's things like that um, that I wanted to get into more and more. And now, oh, so that's why I want to make more money. So yeah, I started a new workshop and instead of selling a ticket and, and making more money, I sold a ticket at a discount and said, look, 100% of the, your discounted ticket is going to go right to the burn camp. Awesome. Right? Awesome. So it's things like that. So just realize, I guess, the more you make, the more people's lives you can impact, the, you can bring on a team and that helps you. But also now you have someone that has their livelihood, that their kids have school paid for, you know, the groceries. Are, it's amazing. And you can partner with a nonprofit, make a difference. There's a lot you can do um, when you decide to be one of the good guys that become successful too. Awesome, Matt. Hey, I want to be mindful of your time here. I think you have a cutoff coming up soon. Is that right? Uh, kind of, yeah. Kind of, okay. So I'm, I'm okay for a while if you are, for sure. Okay, okay. Um, 
Well, well, I think maybe we could start to wind down though. And I, it's clear that I could probably have another episode or two with you down the road. Uh, you know, we we'll, we'll keep, keep in touch afterwards, but uh, I would love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like I've only scratched the surface of what, of the wisdom you can impart. Yeah, these go by so fast. Yeah, they do. They do. Um, so just want to ask a couple of things. So like, um, I get, again, just maybe to, to hone in, I think we've already got some great sort of tips and stories uh, from your life and from your your new book that that would help that purpose driven entrepreneur but maybe again just to get back to that that moment when you decided to charge so what um what what did you do there so you you did you just ah. up your rate like uh for your your seminars like how did you go from that that one with the six people to ah. where you are now you know what what so I'll, I'll try to do the short story for this one so what what had happened is it was all through public speaking But now, so I had a chance to speak in Australia for the first time ever. This was 2008. So it was almost two years into trying to scratch and incline and trying to find a way to succeed in this industry of making a difference. And I got a chance to speak in front of 400 people. And I hadn't spoken in front of more than like four people, basically, right? You know, and now I'm 400. And, but he, the promoter said it was this multi-speaker event that everybody has to sell and they split the, the sales. So I said, what do I need to sell? He says, well, most people sell a product for two to $5,000. So I said, okay. Now, mind you, I hadn't been able to sell more than $900 in two years. Mm-hmm. And now he says, I want you to sell two to $5,000 from stage in an hour. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh. But when I went through that mental shift, something changed. And I went, wait a minute. Why the heck wouldn't I? sell a $5,000 package. And you know, one person might listen and go, oh, that's terrible. That's, but we already had that conversation. In my mind, I'm like, no, it, it, if I'm going to have a $5,000 program, which is you know, live trainings on NLP, neuro-linguistic programming and coaching and, and these home studies I've created and all this stuff that's really gonna change lives, I'm gonna put $15,000 worth of value into this thing and I believe it's going to make a massive impact. And turns out it did. So I got on stage and now I had this unconscious um, confidence and desire. It was like, I don't just want to sell because I want to make money. I want to sell because I want to be one of the good guys and prove that you can do the right thing and also be taken care of. And I'm very proud to say that I did well at that event. Nice. Um, I, uh, I showed up broke. <laughs> Uh, dead broke. I mean, I'm talking, I've shared a story on stage before where I had uh, $40 in my pocket. I was overdrawn in both my bank accounts and I had basically lost everything that I built up in real estate and, and finance from earlier in my life, chasing the dream of being a life coach. So over that two year period, I didn't just only make $900. I also lost over a million and a half dollars oh, okay. in real estate and business and revenue. Uh-huh. So here I am showing up with a hope and a prayer. This is my last possible effort. Like if, if I don't make it work here, I can't even get a taxi to get back to the airport to go home, you know, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Yeah. The stakes are yeah. high. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, gosh, I, I remember showing up. Uh, so I'm in Melbourne, Australia and I'm showing up uh, kind of in the downtown area and I had nowhere to sleep that first night. And I didn't know it was before, you know, the time of iPhones and, and uh, I, mean, I think the, I, the first iPhone just come out, but I didn't have, you know, a chase bank app on my phone and all that. So I didn't know how much money I had. So I went to an ATM machine. I put my ATM card in and it went "Eh, eh, eh," negative $200. (laughs) I'm like, Oh no, I put my business ATM card. I'm like, Oh, I got a business account. I'm a business owner. "Eh, eh, eh," Negative $250. Uh, (laughs) So I'm negative $450 in my bank. I have no credit cards anymore. And I check and I have $40 Australian money in my pocket and that's it. That's it. And, And I had nowhere to sleep. So I'm walking around and I noticed there was a sign that said hostels. $33 $33 for a bet. And I was like, well, here we go. Mm-hmm. So I show up and you know, I go in front and I said, I'll take a bed. And the lady looks at me and says, that'll be $53, mate, or however she talked. And I'm like, uh, I'm trying to, like, to be cool about it because it's only 20 bucks, but I don't have it and I have no way to pay it. So I said, oh, I thought it was only 33. She goes, oh, it's just a key deposit of 20. Don't worry, you'll get it back when you check out, mate. And I was yeah. like, well, mate, um, I can't pay you. So I said, you know, no thanks. And I walked out and I didn't know what to do. 
So I'm wandering around and I did what anyone would do when you don't know what to do. I went and got Chinese food, you know, <laughs> cause it was seven bucks, right? And it was hot, right. lots yeah. of it. I figured the MSG would keep me warm at night if I had to sleep on the park. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but like, but I mean, I'm in that place, but I knew that I had a calling. I knew that I had, as you'd say, that hell yes life in my future. I knew that there's something I'm being called to do. And I knew I was putting this earth for what I meant to do. And just because it's not working right now didn't mean I'm not supposed to continue and push forward and push past it to make it work, right? Mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes when it doesn't work, it's a sign that you should stop. So you need to discern for yourself, right? Yeah. But I knew in this case, not working was a sign that I needed to push through, right? Three feet from gold, as, we, as Napoleon Hill would say. So I pushed through and I went and I spoke that night with $33 in my pocket, right? After the $7 Chinese food. And I sold $58,000 from stage. Oh my gosh. That's a over the course of a 75 minute talk. And I had people buy up to $7,000 programs. Um, I, I put on my first advanced training with four people. But now each of the four people, instead of paying $15, they paid $5,000. Right. And every one of those people also did my speaker training that I, I put on afterwards. So everybody we call it conversion, you know, in the industry, 100% conversion to the next. And I'm proud to say that two of those people were dating. One of them became my head trainer in Australia. He's now running his own seven figure business, uh, doing phenomenal in Australia. And it's just, it's, it's cool to look back and see the seeds of, I wasn't willing to stop even when it got hard or even, I mean, honestly, for me, it was impossible. Like I looked at that and said, there's no way I can make this work. After that, if I did not make that work, my plan was to come back to America and do something else. Maybe get back into real estate or I don't know, something. But I pushed through and because it worked, now he and his entire team and staff and all the thousands and thousands of students that they've impacted have all had this ripple effect that I'm just blessed to have to yeah. be a part of it, right? And I have so many stories like that over the last decade that I just I can't imagine having having given up then and I can't imagine doing anything else. Now that's so inspiring. I love that that uh, that moment. You know, like yeah, sometimes it's a sign. Hey, we should move on. But yep. you know, you were able to discern that. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna push through on this. And and that switch from I've got thirty three bucks in my pocket to I just made fifty fifty eight thousand dollars. And that mind shift too, right? Hell yes, lifers. Think about what you're worth, what your offerings are worth, what your what. Uh, what value you have to give to people. And I'll bet when, once you sold that, I don't know if you were like a little bit of like, holy moly, people bought this thing. I better show up for this thing now. Oh, I almost fainted. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe but, it. But yeah, then you just start to fill in to like, yeah, I'm going to give them their, you know, $5,000 worth plus, right? You know, like $10,000. That's right. So, and within three months, I'll tell, I remember that because that was, yeah, that was August. And then I came back in November and I spoke at another event there and I put on some of the other events that I had promised and, and I kept doing the thing. But within three months, I was like, oh, that's who I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm so this guy who does grew that. grew into this person. Yeah, yeah. And within six months, I had broken the record. And I don't, like, the most I ever made in real estate in, in, in business was like about $60,000 a month, which depending on who you are, that's a lot or a little, I don't know, but it was a lot for me, Yeah, especially in my twenties. Right. Sure. But that was the most I had made in revenue. And I'm so proud to say that, you know, within six months I broke that record and only by doing things that are contribution based and giving back and doing what I believe I was made to do. Yeah. And I just think it's important to know that, that like you can be proud that you can earn a great living doing the thing you love to do, doing the thing you're made to do. And you don't have to feel like, oh, I shouldn't charge, you know? And then it's like, you know, and then I went to, you know, $50,000 in a day and a hundred thousand dollars and a quarter million dollars in a day. And, you know, not every day, but it was often enough to make it notable. And I just, every time I hit a record on finance or a record on attendance or a record on um, someone coming to me in tears saying, I can't believe this changed my life because this moment, all that to me is all just different records and milestones. I'm like, wow, we're really doing this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just stop, man. I like, I don't know, I, like I pinch myself and go, did this really all happen? Like, is this, is this our life? And we're sitting here on a podcast right now across the country. And if one person or a million people are listening, someone's going to hear something and go, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to give up. Maybe I'm going to keep doing this thing that I'm called to do. And, and, Dang it, it's worth it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Such the, a great life. 
Absolutely. Hell yes. Um, Hell yes. Well, Matt, um, you know, again, I think we could go on for another hour here, but just to be mindful of your time and uh, to, just to kind of start to wind down here, um, tell us a little bit about where on the internet we can find you. And, uh, you know, I'll be including links in the show notes to your book and so forth. But uh, yeah, what, tell us where we can find you. Oh, thank you so much. That's uh, I really appreciate it. And again, thank you, Nora, for for the time. And and I know I I went off on some stories here and there. And uh, again, I, I hope we had, I had a great time with you. So thank you so much for that. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. It, and if you're podcast listeners, I mean, you know, the, the best place, honestly, is to check out my podcast. It's a lot of fun. I have some great people. I haven't asked yet, but maybe I'll ask live on the air if Norma would come on my podcast. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I would be honored. Absolutely. That would, that would be cool. So I think I'd love to feature you in a future episode. Um, and it's called the Purpose Driven Entrepreneur Podcast. It's on iTunes. Um, it's usually in the top 10 or so in marketing on iTunes. So it's a top chart, uh, top rated podcast. Very uh, blessed that people are listening to it. Um, and we get into, we do two episodes a week. One episode is a uh, teaching where I get into a subject matter, whether it's, you know, this week I did travel hacks for uh, entrepreneurs who are traveling because I've been doing oh, a lot cool. of that lately. Oh, nice. Um, I'll get into motivation, procrastination, time management, whatever it is. We do something on a Tuesday and then interview Friday where I, I grab an entrepreneur and we just dive into the origin story of what motivated them, what started them on that path and why they do what they do. So it's, Friday is a lot less about lessons. So if you love stories mm -hmm. and you love storytelling, it's really me getting into the background and the stories behind these successful visionaries. We've had, you know, uh, my friend Ruben Gonzalez is a four-time Olympian and we get into his mindset and how he is going to, he's going to break the Guinness, the Guinness record for the oldest winter Olympian in history when oh, he competes in Shanghai in uh, 2022 and he's all geared up for that, right? Oh man. It's the coolest thing. And he'll actually span five decades of Olympics. Wow. And, you know, we've had Larry Broughton, who's, you know, he's been on Travel Channel Hotel Impossible a bunch and owns uh, dozens of boutique hotels. So, we, you know, we talk about leadership with Larry and, uh, and just, you know, different people like that. We just get into the stories behind who they are and why they do what they do. Anyway, so that's on iTunes. Just search my name, Matt Browning, or you can go to mattbrowningpodcast.com and there's a link for any platform you use, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever it is, Google Play, they're all there. Um, and then the second thing is if you want to check out the book, um, I'd be honored. Just go to fireboxbook.com, fireboxbook.com, and you can grab the hardcover book straight from the publisher. Um, it's also, of course, on Amazon if you want. There's an ebook there. And you can also, though, there's a 997 training that's available. So step one is buy the book. Step two is you can get the training completely free. It's not a webinar where I sell things. It's literally just a teaching training where I go through the book chapter by chapter and teach on each one of the drives. So it's it literally, I say this on purpose because it's not a marketing funnel for me. It's literally, it, it's dumb. I should probably do it differently, but I just want people to enjoy the book and I want to give them extra teaching about the book. And then you can also sign up to get uh, the Firebox quiz, which will be free for you as soon as it comes out later in the year. Super cool, Matt. All kinds of great value you've offered our listeners today. And obviously, there's a lot of purpose-driven entrepreneurs listening to this. So check out uh, Matt's podcast. It'll be right up your alley. Um, so Matt, at least for now, let's, uh, we got to wind things down. And I always like to um, wind things up by saying, hell yes, together with my guests. Are, are you ready to do that? I'm ready to do it. Okay. So kind of a hell yes. All right. So okay. now before we do that, though, I got to ask you real quick. Yeah, sure. Did you ever watch Stone Cold Steve Austin? No, I haven't. Oh, that's so good. Okay. WWF. <laughs> but that was it, man. He, he was the best. Back in the day. Oh, nine, in the late Cold. 90s. Yeah, he was the best one. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Go Google Stone Cold Steve Austin. Hell yes, you'll love it. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It's a hell yes related. Okay. I'll, I'll check it out. Okay. One, two, three. Hell hey, yes. Yes. All right. Matt, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Norman.